Greetings, folks, in Jesus' name, as usual. I'm coming to you from Arnie's Garage. And I hope I can say some things that's uh, worth listening to. I feel like the Lord has given me something very wonderful. I shared this with the Home Missions Church yesterday, and it was so good, I just felt like I wanted to help you and try to share this with you. I'm reading from the book of Psalms, chapter 8, okay? And I want to read verse 3. When I consider thy heavens and the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Okay, now that's what I want to just get a hold of right now. Lord, bless the teaching and help me to be a blessing to these sweet people. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. What I want to talk to you about is being delivered from the feeling of being insignificant. When David begins to give us this statement, David compares man to the heavens. And when he studies the heavens and the galaxy as best he can see, he is so overwhelmed by the majesty and the greatness of the universe that he, he brings these thoughts and says, what is man when I consider the heavens, the works of thy fingers, He's actually, to me, saying, because of the greatness of your creation, we, we feel insignificant. So I looked up in the dictionary, and I wanted to share this with you. Insignificant, having little or no importance, to be considered trivial, to, to have a low position. Now, when you have significant, watch this, here's the significant full of meaning or purpose or importance, possessing consequence. Wow! What is man compared to the universe? Uh, well, when you look at that, you say nothing. But, but, but I want to tell you something that, that to me, David answers his own statement when he says, When I consider the heavens and the works of thy fingers, the moon, the stars, thou there. What is man if thou art mindful of him, and the son of man if thou visits him? I felt like the Lord let these scriptures leap out to me. What is man to God? Now David feels insignificant because of, of the, the heavens and the universe, but, but I, I, I want to I go to what he was turning around and saying. What is man that you are mindful of him? I looked up in the dictionary, mindful, to be aware of to have in one's mind, to be concerned about, to not be indifferent over. So what is man that, that you are thinking about him, that you're using your mental facilities on him, that, that you look at him and you consider him and you evaluate man and, and you reason about mankind. So it's almost like, to me, the, the, the writer is turning around and saying, when I consider the universe, man seems so insignificant. But when you look at these two scriptures, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Wow! I'd like to just paraphrase that or turn around a little. What is man that your mind is full of him? That you actually think about mankind. Now, when he thought about the heavens and the and the galaxies, and the stars, and the moon, he was just blown away. He felt so insignificant. But when you look at the rest of them and say, but actually, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you visit him? So actually, if you can accept this, mankind is of such great importance and worth and value to God, that mankind is actually on God's mind that he is interested in man, that he cares about man, that he is concerned about man. Now, maybe that doesn't do for you what it does for me. It is mind-boggling when you consider God. Watch this. God, who is the creator and sustainer of all life. He's almighty. He's all-wise, all-knowing. He's majestic. He's eternal having no beginning, having no ending. Watch. He is the ruler of heaven and earth. He is the sovereign magistrate. He is the highest and holiest potentate. 
He's the absolute master and lord and king over everything. He created all things by the word of his power. He rules all life forms. All galaxies are under his control. All planets are under his control. The mysteries of the universe, what's on the other side of a black hole, he's in charge of all that, knows it all. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein. He is so awesome and so powerful that he turns around <clears throat> and he, some way, somehow, in his wisdom and knowledge, he takes care of creating seasons when they come and when they go. He's so powerful, he controls the entire animal kingdom. And one writer said, his ways are past finding out. And he said, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. He is life itself. And nobody really knows what life is. And he is light itself. Watch this. And he is truth itself. And he has no beginning. He has no ending. Woo! He dwells in the light that no man can approach. And after all this majestic portrayal of the greatness and the magnitude and the majesty of our God, he turns around and he says, Yet, with all your greatness and all your majesty, you take time to think about man. What is man that you are mindful of him. Oh, hallelujah. I, I think that is so mind-boggling that God, as great and glorious as he is, that he has a thoughts about me. I wish I could get this to you today. Today, God is thinking about you. He has not written you off because you made mistakes or failures or shortcomings or you're not what you're supposed to be. He thinks about you. When you woke up this morning, you were on God's mind. When you went to bed last night, you were on God's mind. When you went through the days of activities, you were on God's mind. I think that is so mind-boggling that I can have all kinds of hell and chaos and crisis and disaster and unkind thoughts and bad treatment from people and terrible attitudes that are shown towards me with this, that, and the other, and yet I can have the victory because I believe with all my heart, right now, I'm on God's mind. He's thinking about me. He's thinking about what His purpose is for me. He's thinking about how He's going to bring His plan to come to pass in my life. He's thinking about how much He loves me. He's thinking about what he wants me to become. So he orchestrates life and situations and circumstances that I might finally become everything and all things that he wants me to become. Now maybe that doesn't help you, but it inspires me because I am on God's mind. I wish you could just get a hold of that for a few moments today. God is thinking about me. What is man that thou art mindful of him? That, that's a powerful statement because that, when that scripture says what is man, that word is translated enosh, E-N-O-S-H, enosh, which is weak, frail, broken, defeated, mistaken. What is man that you even think about man? When I looked at these things, I said, you know, I'm wondering today about, uh, today, the mayor is not thinking about me. <laughs> the governor is not thinking about me. The corporate executives are not thinking about me. Mr. Biden and Nancy Pelosi and Harris and Schumer and all the rest of these Democrats they are not thinking one bit about me except to tax me half to death and make me obey and become a slave to their, to their rulership. But they're not thinking how they can bless me. In fact, I've got church people that aren't thinking about me. I've got a world of athletes and professionals and excess people and wealthy people and exalt executives. They're not thinking about me. But today... Hallelujah. 
God Almighty has got me and thee on his mind. Woo! That ought to encourage you today. That means even though I'm walking through stuff, I'm not alone. And I have not been forsaken. And God has not thrown me out with the bass water. And he has not somehow thrown me under the bus like some of my brethren have. He still thinks about me. You know, when you make a mistake or an error or you fail or you falter, many times in our movement, the movement is done with you. They just write you off. You're just a piece of trash. You're a piece of garbage. We don't approve of your, your performance, so we don't even give you our thoughts. God looks at us, and with our greatest failures and our greatest mistakes, He still thinks about us. He still loves us. He still has a plan for us. We are not disqualified because we disappoint others, ourselves, or God Himself. Our mistakes and our shortcomings do not nullify God's thought process about us. I, I wish you'd grab a hold of this today. God is thinking about me. God's mind is full of me. He's mindful of me. He knows my ups and downs, my ins and outs. He knows my fears, my anxieties, my hurts. He understands sometimes my attitude is terrible. He's still thinking about me. I say things I shouldn't say. He's still thinking about me. I do things that I should have done better. He's still thinking about me. No sin and no devil and no sickness and no setback and no stupid people can stop God from thinking about me. I wish you'd say that to yourself today. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Oh, hallelujah. I think about this. It's, it's mind-boggling to me that God thinks about me. That God is concerned about me. That God wants me to win at life. Uh, Albert Einstein, who was one of the most brilliant people, I guess, that ever walked in shoe leather. I have him in my, in my office. Well, I used to have an office. Now it's Arnie's place. Einstein made this statement. I want to know the thoughts of God. For everything else in life is purely incidental. I am convinced that Einstein's desire to know God's thoughts and to understand something of the complexity and the majesty of God, to me, caused him to be blessed by God and allowed him to discover many of the secrets and many of the things that, that he was allowed to find. And I think it was because he was hungry to know God's thoughts. Well, I wish I'd have been alive to talk to that sweet man because I would have liked to say, well, guess what? You're on God's mind right now. You're in God's head right now. God is thinking about you, which to me says, wow, what a purpose, what a value, what worth. It must be in the mind of God that God, with all the stuff He's in charge of and all the stuff He's done and all the stuff He's promised to do, that right now, today, I'm on His mind. He's thinking about me. Whew, hallelujah. I think that is so fantastic. That is so wonderful that somehow, some way, He thinks about me. Let me read another scripture to you. In Psalms 40 and verse 5, watch what this says. This is so powerful. Many, O Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works, which thou hast done. Watch this. And thy thoughts, which are to usward, your, to us, your thoughts which are usward, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. You can't even number the thoughts that God has towards us every day. I want to go to the same chapter, verse 17. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Woo! Hallelujah! What does that mean? It doesn't matter the condition that you're in. You're not disqualified because you're poor and needy. Or you're mistaken. Or you've done something wrong. Or you failed. Or you've committed sin. Or whatever it is. He said, I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh on me. 
Hallelujah. Let me go to another scripture. 139 and 17 of Psalms. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Woo! Hallelujah! Now maybe that doesn't turn your motor on, but it does mine. Because important people, and makers and shakers, and wealthy people, and people that are in charge, and people that are leaders of countries, and people that are leaders of, of cities, or states, or, or whatever... Not a one of them think about me. Not a one of them. They don't even give me the time of day. And yet here's the creator of the universe. All money, all wise, all knowing, absolutely God, all powerful. And he turns around and says, you know, I'm thinking about Jeffrey today. I'm thinking about how I can bless him and how I can help him and how I can help him to learn more of my ways and how I can make him grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you understand, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And his ways are higher as the heavens are higher. So his thoughts are. So he's got thinking and thoughts and plans and purposes for your life and my life that are mind-boggling. That he could not even explain to us. Because we wouldn't get it. Because our mind does not compute, does not compute. But right now in the scripture, he's thinking about us. And I want, to, I want to help you with this, because every one of us at times in our life feel insignificant. We feel unworthy. Let me read this again. Insignificant. Watch. We feel so little and of no importance. We feel trivial. We feel low in position. And sometimes some, if, when you feel insignificant, you also feel insufficient for the task that you've got to face. Uh, I was telling the folks when I was praying, there was a scripture the Lord brought to me when I was praying. It's over here in the book of John, when the, the, the Lord said in John 6 and verse 10, He said, uh, verse 10, And Jesus said, Make the men to sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the number was about 5,000. And He took the five loaves and two fish. But, but just before that, in verse 9, he says, there is a lad here with five loaves and two small fishes. Here it is. But what are they among so many? That's the sense of insignificant and insufficient. It, our resource is insignificant. We'll never feed these people. And I tell you again, get what you got, how insignificant and insufficient it may look or appear. Watch and put it in the hands of the Master. And what cannot work in our hands can multiply and grow in His hands. Because in the book of Job, Job writes this wonderful statement. He says, His hands make whole. Woo! Hallelujah! His hands make whole. And so He wants us to somehow get our insignificant supply, our insufficient supply, our inability... If I can say this as kindly as I can, God does not lead or want your ability. Most of the time, our ability will get in the way. Because if God has to use our ability, we'll pose for our picture. He doesn't want our ability, but He does desire our availability. And so we, we need to present ourselves to the Lord and say, Well, I'm not sufficient for this. I... I, 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 I'm just insufficient. I, I just somehow, I feel so insignificant. What am I going to do? It's almost like when the Lord talked to Moses in Exodus 3, and He told him He was going to use him to liberate all those hostage-held Jews from the Pharaoh and from Egypt. Uh, he makes the same response that I think all of us in our lives make at time. First He says, Who am me? Then He says, What can I do? Who am I? I am not able to take on Pharaoh and his kingdom and his empire to bring these people out to freedom and to liberty and to emancipate these people. That's because when we look at the problem and we look at our resource or our ability, 
we feel so insignificant. We're not able, we're insufficient to make it happen. But God doesn't need our sufficiency. God just wants to know, can we yield to Him? Will we turn around and put our inability and our insufficiency and our sense of insignificance? Because I'm telling you, when insignificance and the mood and the sense of that reign in our lives, we start counting our money, we start counting our education, we start counting our skills, we start counting our ability, and t somehow, some way, we get sidetracked. Remember what the Lord said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. So somehow in God's mathematics, He can take less and do more with it. He can take weakness and manifest His strength. He can take our ignorance and show us His wisdom and His knowledge and His ability. Hallelujah. And, and if I can say to you, I have, have battled ever since I first came in Pentecost, my own personal insignificance. My mom and dad, they sent us to Sunday school. I never saw my mom and dad pray in their lives. I don't think we ever had a Bible in our home all my life. I have never ever been taught the Word of God by my parents or any of my relatives. My mom and dad never taught me how to pray. They did send me to Sunday school as a kid. Fine, they didn't go, but they sent me. And then when I came in into adulthood, I felt so insignificant when the Lord brought me out of my drunkenness and my whoremongering and my lying and my cheating and brought me into the Pentecostal work. I felt so insignificant. I had no degrees, just a high school diploma. I couldn't sing. I couldn't play. I couldn't do anything. I could cut the lawn. My wife would clean the bathroom. I could drive the church bus. We could try to help. But you talk about having to battle a sense of insignificance because I didn't have any heritage. I didn't have anything. And then when I came in Pentecost, I didn't have anybody to mentor me. I never had anybody to take me under their wing and say, this is good, this is bad. Here's how you do this. And so I, I, I said, when we first got called into the ministry, you talk about battling a sense of insignificance. When we went to General Conference, Sister Arnold and I, we felt so embarrassed and so awkward and so inferior to all the evangelists and their wives. They all dressed like the cat's meow. They were all big dogs. We were nobodies. Uh, we didn't even go to the evangelist booth because we felt so inferior, so insignificant. We had no uh, background. We couldn't tell them about our Pentecostal heritage. We were nobodies. And we never went to the evangelist banquet because we felt inferior. And then when we started preaching, well, they preached for hundreds and hundreds and even eight and seven, eight hundred. I preached for 15, 35, 40, 62, and I gave myself completely to them. And then the Lord just somehow helped me to defeat that feeling and that sense of inferiority and insufficiency and, and my own personal insignificance. So it's kind of like, and if the Lord be for me, who or what can be against me? And no weapon formed against me can prosper. And greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So even though you feel sometimes that, that you are insufficient and insignificant, you are not insignificant to God. Because if you and I were the only sinners on the planet, Jesus Christ went to Calvary and bled and died for us. And I got something else I want to tell you. I think it's over here. I want to read it, make sure I don't misquote it. But I think it's in Genesis chapter 5. Just let me turn over there for just a second. Genesis chapter 5. Yeah. And this is the book, verse 1, the Genesis of Adam, the day that God created man. Watch. In the likeness of God made him. We are the only creatures that I can find recorded in the scripture that we are made in the image and the likeness of God. Angels are not made that way. Seraphims, cherubim, they're not made that way. It's not recorded. 
The animal kingdom is magnificent it is. None of those critters are made like whales and porpoises. None of them are made in the image and the likeness of God. But here, a little old guy like me, or like you, we were made in the image and likeness of God, which means we have a special place of significance in the plan and purpose of God. So I'm asking you today, don't let a sense of insignificance run you down and, and condemn you and humiliate you and make you say, oh, what can I do? Well, I'll help you with it. You and I can't do nothing by ourselves. But God can do everything. Remember what the Lord said. For it is not by might, nor by power, saith the Lord, but is by my spirit. He doesn't need your ability. He doesn't need your education. He doesn't need your skill. All he wants is you. All he wants is me. So even though we may feel insignificant, like David did when he compared himself to the universe, but you got to go a little further and say, yeah, but wait a minute. When I look at God, and God's on record, said, you're on my mind. My mind is full of you. I am thinking about you today, and I want to bless you, and I want to help you, and I'm going to bring you through your trouble, and I'm going to take you through your crisis, and I'm going to make a way where there is no way, because I'm a way-making God. And if we could somehow, some way, grab a hold of just these simple thoughts right now, that you are not insignificant, you are not worthless, you are, you are not of little value. You remember, the scripture says, angels which are greater in might and power, yet with all those angels that backslid and got thrown out of heaven with Lucifer, God has never gone on record that I can find one time he ever tried to save something as great and as magnificent as angels. But he has moved heaven and hell to try and save the two naked people in the Garden of Eden and their offspring. That's what the whole story of redemption is. We're not trash. We may be trashy living or acting, but we're not trash. We're just hidden treasure. And God looks at us and said, you're worth saving. Woo! I wish you could receive that today. You've got value today. Even though it may be hidden, even though you don't have any idea where it is, God can look at our lives and say, there's some jewels in there, there's some treasure in there that I can transform and turn them into a child of God. So please hear me. God loves you. God thinks about you. God has got you on His mind all the time. We are on His mind daily. What is man that you think about Him? Hallelujah. What is man that you consider Him? What is man that you've planned a new Jerusalem for? What is man that before the foundation of the world, you had already planned the incarnation and the suffering of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the shedding of blood and the resurrection of of Jesus from the dead, and the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, and the building of the church. What is man that you would think about that? He's never done that for angels. There's never been anything shed, no blood shed, no redemption, no substitute for angels. And they were mightier and greater in power than us. But God turned around and said, I'm going to do this for the people that are on my mind. Because I think about you. I hope and pray somehow today I could inspire you. And I could challenge you. And I could cause you to realize God's thinking about me today. He's thinking about the test or the trial you may be going to be faced with. He's thinking about the evil that Satan's going to try to do to trip you up or distract you. Or disappoint you. Or make you feel like, what's the use? Please hear me. God is thinking about, I'm going to read it again. What is man that thou art mindful of him? What is man that you are mindful to be aware of, to have in one's mind, to be concerned about, not to be indifferent over? You have significance. You are full of meaning and purpose, though you may not have discovered it yet. 
You have an importance with God. You possess a consequence that is yet to come out. What is man? What is man? Compared to the universe, well, you don't think much. But Lord, when you have set your heart on me, whoo, hallelujah, I wish you'd grab a hold of that. In spite of my weakness and my shortcomings and my failures, and at times my feeling of insignificance, the scripture says, you have set your heart on mankind. You want to keep him for your treasure and bless him and smile on him. And even though man has failed and fallen, you have not forgotten him and you have not forsaken him. So with all your wisdom and knowledge, with all our shortcomings, you work to recover us, to restore us, to reconcile us, to forgive us, and to use us. I think that's mind-boggling. And I, I, I'm just bringing you a little short little Bible study because I, I've got another one I want to bring to you after this in just a, in a little while. I want to, I want to talk to you about what is man that, that you visit him. I'm going to, I'm going to talk to you the next time about the God who visits mankind. I pray that somehow, some way, these thoughts will encourage you and inspire you and lift you up and make you to realize I'm not junk and I'm not worthless and I, and I, and I do have significance. I am not insignificant. God said, I'm thinking about you today. You are on my mind today. I am watching your steps. I am seeing what's going on. I'm seeing the tricks of your adversary. You're on my mind. I know how much you can take, and I know where the point is that you break. You are on my mind, and I'm going to keep you, and I'm going to protect you, and I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to use you for the kingdom of God. Father, please help. Bless these sweet people today. Let these people realize that they are not insignificant, that some way, somehow, they, they have worth and value to you, that you would bless them and cause them to realize that you are precious in their sight. Oh, God, please encourage them and strengthen them today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. I'll be back shortly. God bless.